Okay, hello everybody. I'm very excited to be here today with Julia Wood, who's an occupational therapist. And we have so much to talk about regarding continuity of care, how to find the best resources throughout your entire journey with Parkinson's from the day of diagnosis all the way through and uh, different things that you can do and different things to look out for when you're looking for different providers. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, things to watch out for. Uh, a lot of the things we've been talking about lately have to do with exercise and Parkinson's. I've been getting so many emails and so many people asking us about what to do when it comes to exercising safely. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that as well. So, but in order to get started, Julia, can you just tell us who you are and how you got interested in working with people with Parkinson's? So I am fortunate enough to be the occupational therapist at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center, which is a partner with the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center at the University of Pennsylvania. So we partner with their center of excellence and provide therapy services. And um, I also serve as an ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation. So I'm really excited to play that role in helping to link people in our community with the resources for the Finney Foundation because so much of what I do as an occupational therapist is really work on empowerment for people um, through resources in the community, through their own um, self-resilience and building the tools and resources that they need to live well with Parkinson's. So it's been a great matchup. And um, it's kind of interesting how I got, how I you know, began working with Parkinson's. So I treated, I, my I should say my previous experience, I should go back a little bit actually. Um, I owned an exercise studio in Seattle, Washington because my undergraduate degree is in exercise science and wellness. So I had a Pilates and gyrotonic studio and I first had a few individuals with Parkinson's um, toward the end of the, the stay there and I really enjoyed working with them and I was amazed at actually how much you could get from them. I think I kind of began um, working with them and, and based on information from other trainers, oh, you can't do a lot, you know, there's not a lot you can really do to help them. And I really didn't find that to be true. Um, so then if you fast forward, when I went back to graduate school, which was actually a second career for me in occupational therapy, um, I did my clinicals at the Mayo Clinic Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota. And my favorite absolute favorite patients were my patients with Parkinson's. And I was just amazed at um, how much you could um, bring them forward and really, you know, get them excited and help them do better and, and leave quickly and, and get back home to their loved ones and their family. And I remember even asking my clinical educator and I felt a little silly because at Mayo, everything's very research-based and, and which is great. But I said, is there something about having Parkinson's that makes people nice or do just nice people get Parkinson's? Because I really felt like all of my clients with Parkinson's were the nicest people. And I just enjoyed treating them and working with them and their families were lovely. So that really started the whole journey. And then ironically, I'll shorten the story, but I wanted to work with Parkinson's and my husband was like, could you pigeonhole yourself anymore? You know, we were trying to come back from, I lost my studio in the recession and so it's trying to, you know, really move forward. Um, and I didn't, the job that I have now was not actually posted. It was posted as inpatient rehab at Pennsylvania Hospital and I reluctantly applied for it. It wasn't really what I wanted. I kept wanting Parkinson's, but my husband's like, you kind of just need to get a job. And so um, I thought, I was seeing things when I opened the email and they said there'd been a misposting and that it wasn't inpatient rehab. Um, it was actually outpatient with Parkinson's. And I had to go get my husband and go, am I really seeing what I think I see? Because I think I've lost my mom. I'm just imagining this at this point. Um, and so I, I emailed back, yes, absolutely. And tried not to get too excited, but I really was. Um, and I interviewed and had the job within a week. And so it was really strange. And it's one of those serendipitous moments where if things are meant to be, they really do happen because it was really my passion and, and something that I really love doing. And so I feel very blessed and fortunate, I guess it's my short, short way of telling a long story. <laughs> that, I love that. That is, that is very cool. You were meant to be in that role for sure. That's great. And good job for your husband for telling you. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
people really find us a number of ways. Um, we are both, you know, being partnered with the Movement Disorder Center, I'd say the, the majority of our clients that come to us are referred by the doctors, the movement disorder specialists in the practice. Um, but we also do people find us on the LSVT big website or on the power website or even in the news, you know, um, one of our trainers recently was was on um, the local news and, and a, a big spotlight because she worked with a, a former political figure here who has now been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so we really got an influx of people then and we want what he's having. Um, and so we do, we do get people in a, a variety of ways. And definitely we see people across the lifespan um, and across the progression with this condition because our director of neurology really tends to send people um, at diagnosis and he wants them to have multidisciplinary evaluations by PT, OT, and speech so we can really work as a team um, because the research really speaks to a team-based approach. And if you think about the myriad of symptoms with Parkinson's, so we're looking at motor symptoms, you know, that can affect, you know, balance, walking, movement, um, even fine motor coordination and hand dexterity. But then when you look at the non-motor symptoms, fatigue and sleep and and issues, you know, depression or anxiety that come about, you can see where it really does involve a team. It takes a village, so to speak, to really make sure that someone, the complexity is being addressed and that we're not missing anything. And I think that's where the movement disorder specialists like for us to come in. And often if someone is newly diagnosed and say they're already active and engaged, um, we might see them once and evaluate and do some preliminary testing and say this is great or maybe you need to intense you know create some more intensity in your exercise program i might talk to them about making sure that they're utilizing things that that focus on their hands and fine motor coordination or maybe cognitive activities um, because we have a saying too that I prefer rather than putting out fire, so waiting for someone to get bad enough for therapy, which is often what we hear, we call it prehabilitation. So we want to see someone when we're really, you know, got the pom poms out, you look great, this is good, let's maintain this. And here's the tools you need to help maintain. And then we tend to follow up every say, you know, if we feel like the person is, is really healthy and engaged and has a great social and, and you know, support network at, um, with family and friends and is exercising, we might see them every six months or once a year. Um, but if we feel that, you know, we need to kind of keep an eye on them, maybe it's someone who hasn't exercised and maybe is having a little bit more trouble with the diagnosis, then it might be that we see them more like three months to make sure that they're not needing any more resources from us. Um, and if someone does need treatment, if someone comes in and, and they're having, you know, balance problems or difficulty with daily living tasks or, you know, cognitive performance, often early on I see people having issues with job performance because executive function can become a problem early on. So helping them have tools and strategies in place to really maintain their job performance is important. So it, it's really based on the individual. We might see someone for a once and done or we might follow them with a plan of care. The idea that you have for your clinic is so good. We wish it was literally on every corner of every city and every place. Uh, who are the people, who are the providers in your clinic? You have an occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech pathologist. You have a personal trainer, is that right? Or you just have one that you work with? We have personal trainers in the community that we will refer to. We don't have one directly at our site. Okay, and then you have like a clinical social worker or a counselor? Yes, we have, um, we have actually multiple clinical social workers who provide free counseling services through a grant Parkinson's Council. Um, we have nursing services that are specialized for Parkinson's so they can help with medication questions and things of that nature. So it really is comprehensive and we work together. We really try to all communicate and, and work well to make sure that everyone's needs are met to the best of our abilities and even for care partners too. I was going to say, do, do the care Family partner. and the care partner. Absolutely. Absolutely. It takes, it, you know, it really does um, it affects the whole family. And so you have to make sure that their needs are met as well. Yeah. You've worked uh, being a, an ambassador. You've been out in the community a lot. You've also worked closely with your other fellow ambassadors. What are some of the things that you 
noticed or have experienced with the people who come to your clinic versus the people who, you know, aren't taking advantage of those kinds of resources. I know that for me, I sometimes have a hard time. I don't want to convince somebody to do something. It's, I can make a suggestion, but they'll say, I don't need PT or I don't need OT or I'm not like that. So uh, what are, you know, just some of the benefits that you've seen versus people who are, you know, maybe just working with their MDS or neurologist? Absolutely. That's a great question. So, you know, we, um, I have the, the fortune as well for teaching for the Allied Team Training Program for Parkinson's, and we have people come in in the communities that we go to and visit um, to serve as like a volunteer, basically, and interact with all of the disciplines. Um, and it's actually sometimes amazing and sometimes heartbreaking to see what's not being provided for people. Um, there were, you know, I've seen young people newly diagnosed who have given up work because they have started to have problems with executive function. And even in just talking with them and working with them briefly, I thought there was so much potential here, you know, but it, it just, there wasn't the support put in place to really give that person the strategies and tools they needed to keep working if they want to. You know, I'm not here to force people to keep working, but a lot of times people don't want to, you know, stop working as soon as they do. And um, we saw another woman who, especially a, a thing that I notice a lot is often if, if, if the affected side is the non dominant dominant hand side, you start to see a lot of learn non-use with that arm. So say if someone's right-handed, um, they'll, you know, and it's, it's the left hand or left side that's affected, um, they really, because they can just avoid using it for things. And so really, uh, we had a woman recently, this was interesting, who came into our center because she had been misdiagnosed with ALS, um, and it's actually Parkinson's. And I think all it was is she was not diagnosed for quite a while and she really stopped using that affected hand and that affected side. And so it looked weak. It looked very, um, you know, ALS like to a, a non movement disorder specialist who had evaluated her. So you do really see varying levels all the way to, you know, say if you take someone that maybe they're not having any serious impairments like that, but they're not exercising at the intensity level that they should, you know, they're going for walks or doing things, but they're not getting their, their heart rate up to that level that we want. They're not really focused on that. Or maybe they're starting to withdraw socially a little bit, or, you know, they don't have people to talk to, even not getting good education. You know, because so many people still have a lot of miseducation and, and misrepresentation of what the medications do and don't do. And so I think that it's important, and that's a lot of why I think the doctors send them to us, because they know we'll help them find the community resources they need. We'll provide that education piece. We're allowed to spend more time with them. You know, a lot of times the movement disorder specialists might see them, you know, once every, you know, six months, but we get to really see them and, and be there for questions and ask as a support. So I, I think that everyone should try to, you know, seek out those resources so you can have people to work together on your behalf and people that can really help support you on this journey. It's not about being bad enough for therapy, you know. It really is about having a network to support you and provide resources and answer your questions and empower you. And I think the more people that you can have do that, the better. Great. So I want to go back a little bit to what you said around exercise. Uh, we recently did a survey uh, with our list. We had a really great response. And one of the interesting things that came back was I think 70, around the 70%, maybe a little bit more people said that their most primary form of exercise was walking. And that is fabulous. I don't want to take that away from anybody walking has a million benefits like get up in the morning and make sure that you get sun on you right away that you're in the light it's really really good however I think that as you spoke there there is a missing piece on the intensity with walking and so what are some things that you would suggest not everybody has a we'll talk about this later but not everybody has a, a center to go to and get the right information um, I would say keep walking but what is something else they could add that would sort of address that intensity in a safe way? So definitely what the research speaks to most, and I think is most accessible for people um, pretty much anywhere, uh, is the, the cycling. So a stationary bike, 
you know, recumbent if possible, if necessary. Some people can be on a stationary bike. Some people need the back support for safety more um, because the studies coming out of the Cleveland Clinic on the forced amplitude cycling really suggests that there's some great benefit that happens when people hit that higher intensity. Um, one thing that is interesting to note though, when that study first came out, you know, we would get scripts from doctors that would say, you know, 30 minutes of site of stationary cycling, 80 to 90 revolutions per minute. You know, and I'd look at the this little lady sitting across from me, newly diagnosed, and say, When's the last time you exercised? You know, 30 years ago. And we're like, okay, you know, this is what the research speaks to, but that person's not really ready for it. So I think that there's ways that, you know, you can play around with starting to get that intensity. So the, um, the University of Delaware here has done a great program with a not so great name called the Speed Geezer Protocol. <laughs> And so what it does is it takes an interval based approach to um, upping the amplitude and the intensity. So someone starts out cycling on a stationary bike for five minutes at what is a comfortable pace for them, what feels natural and fluid. That's considered to be their preferred pedaling cadence. So it might be 50 RPMs, it might be 60, you know, whatever feels natural. They do that for a five minute warm up at the end of the warm up. For 15 seconds, they're asked to go as fast as they can. So it might be 70 revolutions per minute. It might be 80 to 90. You kind of see where they hit. At the end of that 15 seconds, they go back to their preferred pedaling cadence that they were at at the beginning. And they can do intervals of that for, you know, up to 10, 15 interval cycles and then do a five minute cool down back at that preferred pedaling cadence. So it starts to build up the idea of going faster and kind of seeing what is fast for that individual. Of course, you know, we always want to make sure for anyone with Parkinson's, they don't they are a person with Parkinson's, so I always encourage them, you know, make sure that you don't have any exercise restrictions based on your heart or cardiac performance, you know, from your primary physician or if you are seeing a heart doctor. So you want to make sure you're safe to exercise and safe to increase intensity, but it's a great program and we've had a lot of people really enjoy it because they're, they feel like they're able to push that intensity, but in a way that's a little bit more personalized and, and comfortable and appropriate to their level of fitness. Right. So, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people about perceived exertion, right? Like, how are you feeling a lot? Right. We, some of these people, they come in and they haven't had a history. They weren't athletes. They haven't had a history of working out. And then they find the one thing that they can do that's going to help them is exercise. And it's so overwhelming. And so we just want it to be something that you're going to do. And I think that, you know, the idea of uh, just kind of going at a place that you feel like you could keep going for for a long time feels good and then you know any anything that you can do to, to pump it up always talk to your doctor about it um, but you know what feels difficult for you is probably a good sign that you're you're doing something right like and it might you'll grow over time but there's no need to give yourself you know so that you can't get up the next day or you're too sore or too tired or too whatever we we uh we want you to keep moving and uh keep walking and doing the things that you really enjoy and if you can add a few minutes of um high intensity then it's a great thing to experiment with and say wow I'm walking and now I added this and such and such happened. It's a really great way. Maybe it's something that you'll decide to do every day. Maybe you just do it a few times a week, but um, it's a great thing to experiment with, I think. Okay, so I kind of touched on this a little bit, but what advice do you have for people who don't have access to centers like yours? People who live in rural areas or underserved areas, how can they benefit from some of the skills that the people at your center have? Is there uh, places that you direct people to? Obviously, the Davis Finney Foundation, of course, but, uh, you, know, di you know, digitally, virtually, what are some things that people can do? So definitely, I think it's a little easier to address um, speech therapy concerns digitally than it is some of the PT and OT um, because there are, you know, there's a telehealth option with the LSVT Loud program. It's not covered by Medicare because, not because Medicare doesn't cover LSVT Loud, but because they don't cover telehealth services for speech therapy at this time. Um, but there are some resources that you can find online where people pay privately for it. Um, some people do the 
allowed for life in an online digital format as well. Um, and there is a companion program for the LSVT Loud program that's some software that can be used by the individual. So they do have some initial visits with a speech therapist in person, but then they're able to utilize those resources online to track their progress. And all of these um, resources, too, for speech, what's interesting is they have been specifically researched and there's evidence to support them. So it's not just like they took a program that worked and, and put it online. Um, as far as with exercise, you know, that becomes a little bit trickier and like physical and occupational therapy. Some great resources to find someone in your area because at this point, in a lot of areas, there are physical therapists at least that have some neuro experience. Um, so a place to start sometimes is in an area if there is a hospital or a clinic that does any type of neurological rehab, even if it's related to like stroke and concussion and things like that, you'll often find therapists that understand dealing with neurological conditions compared to like a knee replacement or hip replacement. Um, another great resource is going to lsvtglobal.com because you can find a list of clinicians by zip code and those are clinicians at least that have taken a training in LSVT big or loud they have some education in Parkinson's they know Parkinson's specific work another resources for that is the Parkinson's wellness and recovery website because you can go on their site and find instructors as well that have taken their course and they certify where LSVT big only certifies um, physical occupational or speech therapist the Parkinson's Parkinson's Wellness and Recovery Program does have a track for um, health or for fitness professionals, is what I'm trying to say. So you could find trainers or exercise um, teachers um, that have had, and with both of those programs, there's education specific to Parkinson's and understanding Parkinson's disease, and then also how to utilize amplitude-based training for exercise and approach. So that's a way to find some exercise and, and also therapists that may be um, close to you. I encourage people too. We have, like I worked with a woman today who lives very rural in Pennsylvania, and you know she drives two hours for a clinic, but at her own um, pace. So sometimes people coordinate it with the, the um, visit with their movement disorder specialist, and they check in, they schedule to see all of us, we give them a homework program, we tweak their program, or give them more resources um, or you know she's actually willing to drive the distance you know about once a month or so sometimes to fill in those gaps so I encourage people to you know if you can and I know not everywhere has that but if you can find someone that you enjoy working with even checking in every six months every three months having that um, connection is really really helpful um, to support you on the journey with Parkinson's but I think definitely look at those resources online um, LSVT Global and Parkinson's Wellness and Recovery to help find the right person. Great, great. Um, so we're going to switch gears a tiny bit. Uh, one of the questions that we've been getting a lot recently from the Parkinson's community uh, is this idea of safety and exercise. And is I want to know, is this something that you're seeing with your patients in the clinic? And what are some of the consequences that you've seen when safety wasn't prioritized? This problem has been coming up quite a bit um, recently, unfortunately. Um, I think as more people are recognizing the need to exercise and be active, um, you know, there are some things that sometimes go on that, that aren't so safe. So recently we had a gentleman who in um, a boxing class he was taking was asked to use a 10 pound hand weight on his affected side. The problem with that was he already had some cervical issues and he did a severe injury to his neck and the nerves coming out. So he's had a lot of problems even with range of motion with his arm, with dressing. Um, he's being seen, he came in to see us and we started trying to do um, the LSVT big protocol, but we found that we really needed the orthopedic therapist to address his shoulder and neck injury first. It was that severe. Um, he's in, you know, 10 out of 10 pain off in and, and having difficulty dressing himself. So it was really sad to see that he's going into this class and really wanting to get better and, and he got a pretty serious injury. We have seen some back injuries or at least back 
pain from people going into boxing classes and, and maybe they're not understanding that they're the rotation and how to do that in a biomechanically safe way and they're just twisting their backs. Um, you know, so I think that it, it, it's important to at least what we encourage people to do is be evaluated by a physical therapist first um, and, and really know what are maybe some limitations for you? What do you need to watch out for? Um, you know, rotator cuff injuries and issues are very common in the general population and also with Parkinson's because a lot of times that affected side, the arm isn't swinging as much. So even just that reduced mobility can affect the joint. So if you go and start doing some, you know, boxing or maybe even yoga, supporting on the arms a lot, and maybe there's not really the range of motion Motion that needs to be there and correct body mechanics, you can risk injury. Um, so I encourage people, if possible, <laughs> be evaluated. Even if you think you're doing great and you don't have a problem, just for them to kind of talk you through some safety ideas. Also, they may know trainers in the area or exercise classes that they recommend that are safe. Um, so, you know, the thing to remember, and, and this became all too clear when, even when I had my exercise studio, is, you know, Physical and occupational therapists, we have a license. So there is a standardized test that we go through and take, you know, to be, now that doesn't mean they're better therapists or therapists you might connect with or not connect with or ones that meet your needs better. I'm not saying all, it means all therapists are amazing, but we do have a standard. There's a licensed standard. Unfortunately with exercise trainers, um, and I can say this having been one, um, there's a variation in certification. So you may get someone who's gone through the American College of Sports Medicine certification, which is really lengthy and extensive, and, and maybe they have a four-year degree like I did in exercise science or two-year degree, um, but you might get someone that maybe has no certification or no training or did an online training in like a day. So it, that's the problem is there's no standardization with certification. So it's not just just because someone says they're a personal trainer or they're teaching an exercise class, they're not, their credentials aren't always equal. Or at least with therapists, you kind of more know what you're getting because there's that standard. Yeah, one of the things that we uh, recommend people do is, you know, don't be afraid to ask your the instructor, what is your specific experience of people with Parkinson's? Uh, and you know, if it's like, well, I, I had somebody in my class with Parkinson's, that's, that's not specific experience. And I think that it's, it can feel diff off, awkward and difficult, but if you don't feel safe, it's okay to walk out of the class. It's okay to, you know, ask the person privately, not in front of everybody privately, like what, what are your credentials? Uh, I'm really concerned about my safety. This isn't, you know, an issue and just be upfront about it and do not be afraid to say, you know, maybe this isn't the right class for me. Um, if you, if you're, unable to, I'm sorry, my dogs are working. If you're unable to get uh, evaluated by a PT, you know, just be super vigilant in your own um, investigation of people. And, you know, it's, that's one of the great things about being part of a support group is you have a lot of people in the class who've done lots of different classes nearby and they can probably give you some great um, referrals and also people to watch out for. Um, so I think we kind of went over that, like some of the questions that people can ask to vet a new person, you know, um, credentials, experience, uh, time working with people, um, how many Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's do they see, have they seen over the course of their career? Um, anything else that you would add to that? Whether it's going to be a therapy, you know, setting or an exercise setting with therapy, is it delivered one to one? So, you know, there are some clinics that are more orthopedic based where there might be one therapist working with three or four people at a time. I really don't feel it's appropriate with Parkinson's. You can't really keep an eye on someone's safety and specific needs. In our clinic, we treat one to one. Um, also, then if it's a class, say, you know, what's the ratio? 
with the teacher to, to participants in the class. You know, are there, because um, sometimes we will have students that are assisting with ours as well. So I guess ratio to, of trainers to participants, you know, what is that like? If it gets over, say, you know, eight or 10, I think you're getting in a danger zone of them really being able to watch. Um, also, I think asking, you know, what safety measures do you have in place, you know, or, or do you see falls in your class often? And, and what um, what ways do you help prevent that or deal with that to keep people from falling? But I think all of the questions that you mentioned before of asking, you know, really ask what is their certification? I think that is very, very important. And look it up. Now online, we can look up what, what is an ACE certification? What is this, you know, also what specialty certifications, if any, do they have in treating Parkinson's? So have they done, you know, power? Have they done any different trainings for education or courses on Parkinson's? Um, so I, I really do encourage people to ask those questions. You have a right, you're a consumer. It's really important. I always loved it as a trainer when people asked for my credentials and asked those questions and wanted to know. And absolutely, please, if you ever feel unsafe, leave a class. I do it. I have a spinal condition that I have to be careful of. And I usually preface that when I go into a class and say, I have to really be careful of my back. I'm not sure if this class will work for me, but I'd like to try it. If anything feels unsafe in any way, shape or form, you know, I, I kindly bow out, you know, but I think that you have to really, when you think about um, with Parkinson's, we feel that exercise is medicine, right? And we want them taking their medicine if they're on medications and those have been recommended by their doctor. We also want their, their exercise to be a priority. If you get injured, nothing will set you back quicker than an injury. So really protect your assets, so to speak, <laughs> and ask questions. <laughs> Yeah, I always say I was talking to somebody not with Parkinson's the other day, but it's it's it applies in this situation. Is you know a lot of times they're paying decent money to go to these classes, and the person was telling me, oh, you know they don't do this, and I you know I can't do that. I'm like, don't do it. Like you're you're paying for this. You actually don't have to do anything you don't want to do. If you want to just stand there and you know, do nothing, not pick up the weight, not bend over, like whatever it is, you have the right to do that. And if they're not okay with it, then you leave. Uh, but safety first, always. So um, like you said, the last thing you need is to be taken out and then not have access to the thing that's actually the most beneficial. Okay, so Here's something that I hear quite often is people say, I don't need that yet, or I'm afraid to go. It's like admitting my disease is getting bad, and I feel like I'm not bad enough to have that. I feel weak. Uh, you know, what is your response to that when people are talking about occupational therapy and physical therapy and speech therapy? I think that's a really common misconception is that people need to be declining or, or, you know, doing poorly, or, you know, it, it's a sign that their disease is progressing when they need to see therapies. But I think that, you know, it, it really is important to see us as part of a team member on a journey with you. And, you know, we're there to support and reinforce and help. It doesn't always necessarily mean something's wrong or something's bad. Um, I think that, you know, there's some interesting research that came out that even looked at the motivation in the basal ganglia, you know, with that encouragement and support. So what I see often from people is when they even come in and hear, wow, you look great, you're doing well, that exercise is really working, you can just see them light up. So I think that, you know, we're part of a, a support network actually is how I see it. And just like we talked in the Finney Foundation about having tools in your toolbox, you know, really think of a good relationship. And I do mean that. It should be a good relationship. You should, should look forward to seeing your therapist and not feel like they're going to finger wag, you know, unless you really haven't been exercising and have just been on the couch, you know, doing nothing. They probably will finger wag it. But um, you should really see it as we're part of your team. We want to encourage, we want to support, we want to give the tools and resources. We're one of those tools and resources to help people live well with this condition. And I think it can be really, really beneficial. You know, I'll get random emails from people with a picture. I got one the other day of a drawer pool and I thought, what is this? And it was someone that was like, hey, I'm, you know, remodeling my kitchen. Do you think these drawer poles will be good? And 
hey, you know, I chimed in and gave my two cents worth. It's like, and they felt her like, thanks, because you know, you're trying to make that decision of moving forward with my hand function. Is this really going to work? Um, so we're there to help however we can and really want to be part of the team for you. So don't look at it as you need to be at a level of decline. Look at it even as in the beginning, it's like we're part of your cheerleading squad. We're there to support and encourage and really help keep you on the right track so that you're doing all the right things and we're doing everything we can to support you to live well with Parkinson's. That's great. And you bring up a really great point with that email is, you know, a lot of times we just, we just want to have access when we need access. So part of this part of going to a center like this and finding the right people is so that down the road, something happens, you can actually have someone to send an email to. Like, you don't have to be, oh my gosh, I can't get an answer because nobody's gonna take a new person and answer this silly question I have. Like, it's, it really just makes it so that you can live well. And it's the same as you having a regular doctor and a dermatologist and a, a dentist. Uh, we don't go to those places expecting to have anything wrong. We're going as preventative care and saying like, we go home away and we're like, look at, I got nothing wrong with my teeth. I'm so excited. Um, and it's the same thing. You know, you go and you're like, wow, I'm doing really well. I'm, my exercise is working. My diligence is, is working. So I think that's great. That's great. Absolutely. Good. Thanks. Well, thank you so, so much, Julia, for doing this with us. I know everybody's going to get so much value from it. And depending on when people watch this, we're excited that you're going to be with us in Philly. It's going to be so exciting for the Victory Summit in August. And um, we'll definitely give more information with that um, under the video today. So uh, thanks again. And um, if you guys have any questions, please send them to you can send them to me at M Dizon. That's just M as in Mary, D I Z as in zebra, O N as in Nancy at dpf.org. And if you have any questions for Julia, I can pass them along. And that'll be it. Thanks, everybody.